get started. Welcome. We're so glad that you could join us today for the first of two parts of our speaker series focusing on pandemic impacts on children, youth, and families. I'm Melissa Barnett. I'm the director of the Francis McClelland Institute for Children, Youth, and Families, or FMI, as we call ourselves. I'm really looking forward to these three talks today. Before we get into the talks, I do want to take a moment, although we're joining virtually today, to acknowledge where the University of Arizona and where many of us who are joining are located in Tucson, Arizona. We honor the tribal nations who have served as stewards of this land since time immemorial. We respectfully acknowledge the ancestral homelands of the Tehana Adam Nation, and we recognize the Pascayaki tribe who resides within the Tucson community. We are committed to recognizing, acknowledging, and valuing indigenous peoples and their culture, history, oppression, resilience, and contributions to our communities in Southern Arizona and beyond. I, I would also like to start by telling you a little bit about the Francis McClelland Institute. We're really pleased that we have many of you returning to our events, many old friends today, um, and some newcomers that we're excited to have join us. The goal of the Francis McClelland Institute is to move beyond the university walls to work collaboratively to build strong communities that promote family resilience so that children and youth from marginalized backgrounds have the opportunity to thrive. We do this by supporting innovative research, actively partnering with community organizations, sharing research findings with practitioners and the community, and educating the next generation of engaged scholars and leaders. The work we do is to honor Francis McClelland. Francis lived a life that demonstrated, facilitated, and celebrated resilience. She was a generous and tireless advocate for children, youth, and families, especially those who experienced marginalization and discrimination. Frances also believed in the power of research to improve lives. I also want to acknowledge another alum to whom we're quite grateful. This talk today is part of the Pamela J. Turberville Speaker Series. And Pam continues to be a staunch supporter of FMI and the Norton School. We appreciate her consistent support and generosity in contributing to our missions. Okay, and so finally, um, the format for today. Each of these talks um, applies different frames and approaches to understanding some of the COVID-19 pandemic related effects on three very different populations that we expect might be particularly vulnerable to the pandemic. We will, each of the, the speakers will speak for about 15 minutes. We then ask if you have very specific or targeted questions. We'll, we'll pause for a few minutes. You'll have an opportunity to ask those questions using the question and answer function in Zoom. We ask you to hold sort of bigger picture questions or comments until the end, because at the conclusion of the third talk, we are going to take some time for Q&A and what we hope is a lively and interactive discussion with the panelists. And again, you can do that using the Q and A, um, using the Q and A functions. In Zoom. Okay. So, without further ado, we will go ahead and move on to our first talk. I am going to stop sharing my screen so that Madeline is able to share hers. Um, So our first speaker today is Madeline Dubloy, who is a research scientist with the Community Research Evaluation and Development Team in the Norton School, or CRED as they are known. CRED conducts culturally responsive, policy relevant, community based research and evaluation that promotes the health and well being of children, youth, and families throughout Arizona and the Southwest. Trained in social epidemiology, Dr. Dubloy is, proud, is broadly interested in ways that social phenomena influence health and well-being. As a parent, she is acutely aware of the disruptions to K-12 schools and early childhood educational settings brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic and the ripples those closings, 
uh, those, those changes um, facilitate through families. Thank you, and I will turn the floor over to Dr. Deploy. Great, thank you so much, Melissa, and thanks to FMI for having me here today. Um, I am excited to be here and talking about these caregiving changes for working families uh, with young children during the pandemic. I do wanna acknowledge that there are many others who have worked on this and are who are behind the scenes today. Um, we are almost all parents and caregivers ourselves. So this was as much a passion project as anything else. We are acutely aware that coming back to U of A in a still ongoing pandemic really requires um, an understanding of caregiving and what it will need from supporting systems like caregiving institutions and K-12 schools to return to some semblance of normalcy at U of A. So this project, what we call the University of Arizona Care Project, was one of nine funded by the University of Arizona Research Advancement Grant Program as part of the 2020 research opportunities during the phased approach to restarting. We were excited to get it because it suggested that U of A realized that a successful return to campus life depended not only on the bioscience heavy side of things like test, trace, and treat, but also that there was a lot of complex social changes that were happening as well that would need to be understood and dealt with. The main goals of this project were twofold. First, to document the burden and the potential implications across work and study for caregivers during the pandemic. And then, because U of A doesn't collect data on this otherwise across the board, to figure out how many people are in this position of being a caregiver during the pandemic amidst all of this disruption. Um, we were hoping to get as broad a sample as we could to try to provide some estimate of this that is otherwise lacking across HR or any other data system. I do wanna note that in our survey, we were very intentional to say, as long as you identify as a primary caregiver, whether you are a parent or a guardian or a grandparent or any of those categories that you may fall into, as long as you identify as this, you are welcome to take our survey. Um, for shorthand and expediency today, I will also often just use term parents, but I mean the umbrella approach to all of these people. Um, for our survey, we sent out email and social media materials that aim to reach the entire U of A community. So we really wanted to get some sort of idea of caregivers versus non-caregivers. And so our initial screener survey was targeted at anyone and everyone in the UA umbrella. That was inclusive of faculty, staff, undergrads, grads, postdocs, designated campus colleagues. Anybody who fit the bill of having a net ID was welcome to say, yes, I am part of this community and I'd like to tell you about my experience. Um, we did require that folks were over the age of 18 and able to complete it in English. From our short screener survey that we asked everybody to take, if you identified as a primary caregiver for a child, someone under 18 years of old, um, you were then invited to take a much longer form survey that really got into the details of that. For folks who wear multiple hats, because we know there are many of them at U of A, they could self-select either into the employee version of the survey or the student version. We ended up with about 5,000 responses to the screener survey. The data I'm sharing today are from a set of analyses we did this fall and reflect 3,790 U of A employees. For employees, our response rates were around 30% for both faculty and staff populations. Postdocs and contractor temporary workers are in this employee category, but as you can see, they were super tiny and not particularly um, adding a lot to how how parents are experiencing this. Um, so they're there, but not very well represented. And then the graduates and undergraduates had um, a much lower rate of response. So for now we are focusing on employees. In terms of the sample that we ended up with, among those who are parents and caregivers, which was about 40% of staff and 47% of faculty, over a third of employee parents are caring for a young child. Um, so that's those who have just a child under five, as well as those who have a child under five in addition to a school-aged child or more. We know that having younger children is typically a marker of having meatier children in terms of experiences go. There's the feeding, the settling for naps, diapers, stories, hours of being coached through different roles in imaginative play, 
Um, so this represents a, a very specific burden on parents and thus their time. To give you some sense of who's represented in the 270 employees who did our long survey, who are caregiving for a young child, um, they are reflective of the faculty staff ratio of U of A overall, which is about three to one staff to faculty. And you will probably not be surprised that our respondents were largely female. Article after article in the past year has talked about the ways in which the pandemic has affected mothers and mothers here at the university were no different. They were eager to tell us about their experiences. This has been the only study I've run where respondents have gone out of their way after a long survey to email us to thank them for asking these questions and giving them a venue to talk about their experiences. Um, a little bit more of context about these 270 folks. We had 41% of families who had only one child, but 14% had three or more. 15% had at least one child with special needs and 3% had multiple children with special needs. 35% interacted with an adult who was at particular risk for COVID-19. Um, so that could have been a grandparent providing care, that could have been the caregiver parent themselves. 14% uh, lived in the same household as that at-risk adult and 13% depended on that at-risk adult for childcare. So that's obviously a consideration in how parents are going to think about sending a child into a group care situation. Um, and families came from a variety of economic backgrounds though we did tend to skew towards a higher household income. You were promised a talk on changes in caregiving. So let's get into those changes. Um, a large majority of our respondents reported using some form of non-familiar care. So whether that's a nanny or a daycare or a preschool before the pandemic. Um, and then as of September, that had dropped to less than half. Who picked up that slack? Families, working parents. So families who the parent had some other employee role in addition to their caregiving responsibilities, maybe a parent with a part-time schedule or a flexible schedule had provided care in over a quarter of families before the pandemic anyway. As of September, that had jumped to three quarters of families. Before the pandemic, only 8% of employees with small children had relied exclusively on parental care. So typically that stay at home parent model. And that had jumped nearly to half by the fall. Uh, when we asked parents about their reasons for change, and this is now across parents of children of all ages for a moment, we saw that most commonly parents had no choice. Schools and childcare centers had shut down at the start of the pandemic. For parents of younger children, we see that that is still a major issue, but the number one reason was about parent caregiver concern around COVID related safety. So this makes sense. School attendance for older children is mandated. Truancy laws are real. For parents using childcare and preschool programs, those are optional. So the ability to continue became less absolute and more subjective. Notably at the bottom there, you'll see there are about 12% of families who didn't experience some sort of disruption in their childcare arrangements meaning that nine out of 10 were scrambling to adapt to some new form of normal. Despite having slightly more control over whether to continue in their pre-pandemic arrangements, there were still major pressures coming from the provider side that affected families with young children. Full closures or transitions to remote learning were certainly happening. And even if you don't have a toddler or preschooler at home, you can imagine the parental eye rolls that come with, we're gonna transition our three-year-old class to remote school. It's just not a thing that works for people in most cases. There's also issues with scheduling, affordability, the provider not feeling safe in the pandemic, or schools that permanently shuttered. Another thing we saw was that even if a provider was accessible, families were wary of sending a children. About one in five reported that the possibility that their center would close, close presumably suddenly because of a COVID outbreak, uh, was too much of a gamble. They needed something more stable, and so they switched to something else. Others didn't want their young child to have to go back to the child care program that was filled with new public health protocols. Mask wearing, social distancing, these kinds of things were daunting to about 13% of parents of young children. We also saw that the dramatic shifts in employment and economics that swept across the country were reflected in the choices that families here are making too. Caregivers shifted hours, 
took on new jobs, lost jobs, had wages reduced. In some cases, early care and education providers raised tuition to cover their reduced child staffing ratios or the new cleaning protocols they had to implement. For those who cited affordability as a reason to change, the UA furloughs were a major factor. It's also worth noting here that 17% of our respondents were paying to hold a spot that they were not actively using in a childcare program. As these many shifts happened, parents and caregivers added a lot of hours of caregiving work to their days, but not equally. We asked respondents to estimate how many more hours a day they were spending on caregiving now compared to before the pandemic. On average, it was about 6.6 .6 hours, which is the better part of a workday. But parents of color and women took on significantly more hours than white parents or men, respectively. Not surprisingly, these shifts were disruptive. 73% of parents and caregivers said the loss of childcare was very or extremely disruptive, and 80% described those transitions as very or extremely stressful. Overlaying the ideas of different kinds of caregiving and stress, this goes back to our screener population for a moment, so over 3,500 people, to illustrate again that there are varying degrees of stress as you shift caregiving roles. So on this one to 100 scale of how stressful um, working or studying during the pandemic has been since March for you. Those who had no caregiving responsibilities were on average at the lowest end, taking up through those who cared for adults, then to those who cared for children, and then those particularly strapped, um, commonly known as sandwich generation caregivers, those who are caring generally for their own children and their parents or their parents-in-law simultaneously. So going back to our parents of young children, we also wanted to unpack what in particular were the key stressful experiences of the pandemic for parents. These in ranked order were the reasons that over half of parents of young children indicated that their pandemic experience had been highly stressful. Um, what we see is at the top of the list, there is that fundamental, what the heck do I do with this child concern? Um, but it was closely followed by a range of issues from health to coping with uncertainty finances, and social isolation. These stresses went hand in hand with related worries. What you see here are the proportion of parents of young children who reported that the statement was somewhat to completely true for them. Topping the list again is concerns about their children and their child's development, but it's followed closely by mental health and burnout, as well as mental health of other family members and family relationships. The stress that everyone was experiencing manifested in concrete ways with regards to mental health. 37% of employee parents of young children met the referral threshold for anxiety, and 23 met the referral threshold for major depressive disorder. These do align with Arizona results to the U.S. Household Pulse Survey from about the same time period this fall, but they are several times higher than where they were in pre-population rates. Relatedly, many people reported ways of managing the additional responsibilities that highlighted some really significant trade-offs. So we see shifts that could affect physical health and mental health, giving up exercise and sleeping less, and just a blanket statement that balancing their career with caregiving during the pandemic necessitated personal sacrifice. It's all starting to paint a pretty dire picture and something needs to give. Uh, so we asked parents how many had debated leaving their job as a result of these burdens. We found that among families with young children, about three in 10 of U of A employees had moderately or seriously considered leaving their job in order to manage their, their pandemic caregiving responsibilities. Um, there wasn't a huge difference there between faculty and staff, but we do see that when we compare parents of young children to parents of any age, um, those with kids of any age in staff, there is a pretty sizable difference there. So the alternative to leaving one's job is figuring out how to make the job possible, given the responsibilities that you have at home. Over half of employees felt the need for some or substantial accommodations to continue working effectively. But about a third didn't know what they could ask for, and that was especially true for faculty. Over half didn't know what kinds of accommodations they could or should be asking for. Even if someone had an idea of what could help, it wasn't necessarily easy to ask. 39% of respondents reported being at least somewhat concerned about asking for accommodations. 
I also thought it was really interesting um, that about half reported not knowing about expanded family medical leave as an option. So this is a federally enacted and UA supported process for giving parents FMLA like leave specifically to manage caregiving responsibilities during the pandemic. So what would help? We asked that too. At the top of the list was this item that um, parents would like to see no career related decisions made in the wake of the pandemic for parents or caregivers. This reflects the concern that careers would likely suffer for a less productive year than usual. We also saw perennial parent asks for things like on-site childcare facilities and additional financial support from childcare from the employer. There's also a lot of people who are saying, don't just not penalize me for this year, don't reward or penalize anybody else for it either. For some, the shift to working from home, the evaporation of a commute, the extinction of social activities, it may have meant more time to excel at work. And so we heard from parents that they're concerned that even if they're not explicitly penalized for a slow year, the implicit penalties to somebody else's productive year are a problem. Based on these concerns, um, we put together some suggestions for employers on how to support caregiving employees during the pandemic. It's a uh, continuing to allow remote work whenever possible, especially and at a bare minimum <laughs> until schools and ECEs are fully operational continuing to embrace flexible work schedules, the creation of family, family, work, family friendly workplaces. Um, having and communicating is a really big part of what an organization and employer can do to minimize the negative career impacts. Um, and the ever present idea of if you offer childcare benefits, make them flexible. Um, a lot of people noted for U of A in particular that you couldn't hire a pod teacher or a nanny with the U of A benefits because they required a very formal care situation. So they didn't transfer well to helping parents cope during the pandemic. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, here's our contact information and a link to the brief that we wrote for FMI on this. Um, I would love to take any questions. No, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, um, but thank you. You gave, you gave us lots to think about. And, um, oh, I do see one question that just came up um, from Desiree. Do you plan on doing qualitative focus groups for this project? Yes, so that is actually, so our, our study had <laughs> four phases um, as we think of it. So there was the initial screener survey, the long parent survey, then from their parents, could um, opt into being willing to participate in an interview. We are just getting those interviews underway now. So we're hoping to get about 50 folks from across different roles at U of A um, interviewed. And then the final piece of this that we're really excited about are hopefully um, before all is said and said to do some data interpretation sessions with leaders within the U of A community so that when we synthesize all these results into some policy recommendations, a white paper type product for U of A at the end of this, um, that it's got some feedback from folks who are in a position to maybe change some things. Um, and so yes, interviews are upcoming, focus groups not so much, um, but there, there will be a lot of data. <laughs> and one of the requirements from RII for the funded projects um, is that eventually these data make it to a repository. Um, so they will also live out there for others who are interested in delving into some questions as well. Thank you. So if there are any other questions out there, please you know, save them um, for the end. Uh, but thank you very much to Madeline. And we will move on now to our next speakers. So this is a joint presentation by Seon Kim and Zhen Zhao. Say is a fifth year graduate student in the Family Studies and Human Development program with a minor in educational policy. Her research agenda focuses on three primary areas, understanding the impacts of family dynamics, cultural mechanism, education and community on racial and ethnic minority youth, social emotional well-being and academic experiences over time. 
unpacking intersections of social inequities and educational policy for racial and ethnic minority youth and families, and examining how race-related experiences work together with families' culture as adaptive strategies to shape youth development. Jen is a third year doctoral student in the Family Studies and Human Development program here in the Norton School at the U of A. His research focuses on sexual and gender minority youth's experiences of disclosing and or concealing sexual and gender identity in dynamic contexts. Specific areas of his interest include how interpersonal, interpersonal, contextual and cultural factors affect youth's disclosure or concealment how the experiences of disclosure or concealment contribute to youth's well-being and academic achievement from the perspectives of, of intersectionality and advanced research methodologies and statistical analyses utilized in youth research. And they, I will turn it over to them now to talk about their findings from an interesting study. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be presenting the preliminary results of our study, Asian Voices During the Pandemic, Changes in Ethnic Identity, Discrimination, and Activism. My name is Say, and I will be sharing our findings with Jin today. Our team is comprised of five Asian graduate students across disciplines at the U of A, and our project has been supported by Dr. Russ Toomey. In addition, we acknowledge APASA, Asian Pacific American Student Affairs, Korean Graduate Student Association, and Association of Chinese Students and Scholars support in our participant recruitment. As Asian students at the U of A, we witnessed a firsthand the increased racial bias and discrimination at the beginning of the pandemic. And we began to discuss collectively whether Asian voices are heard and considered in our community and society. We thought that it is our responsibility to provide platforms for Asian students as scholars in social science. In this study, we examined how the COVID-19 pandemic that began in the United States in early 2020 has elevated risk of Asian American ranging from physical attacks to discrimination to verbal harassment and vandalism. Anti-Asian discrimination, hate speech, public shunning, physical assault has been occurring in the landscape of, of American racism only to prove that Asian Americans are not only not honorary whites, but their status is in doubt during the COVID-19 crisis. Asian Americans have been labeled as China virus or Kung Fu and seen as the embodiment of China and potential carriers of COVID-19, regardless of their ethnicity or generational status. In a national online survey, over 40% of respondents noted that they engage in at least one discriminatory behavior towards Asian people. Hate crimes are on the rise again as the pandemic has gone under control. To this end, it is unknown to what extent heightened anti-Asian discrimination affects the development of Asian college students' ethnic identities their sense of connection to intergroup activism and overall well-being. Therefore, in this study, we focus on three aspects that concern Asian Americans during the COVID-19 times. First is discrimination. Our study focuses on individual and structural levels of racism. Since their arrival, Asian Americans have been coined as perpetual foreigners, threatening yellow perils, and model minority. A large body of scholarship documents the ne negative health and psychosocial implications of racial discrimination among Asian young people. Racialization of the coronavirus exemplifies how Asian Americans are still perpetual foreigners and threatening yellow perils and marginalized in their conditional status. Second, we focus on ethnic identity of Asian Americans that, have, that may have changed pre and post pandemic. Ethnic identity is a multidimensional construct that reflects the beliefs, attitudes, and racialized experiences individuals endorse due to their ethnic group membership. Ethnic identity also explains how a person perceives others' views towards their racial ethnic group and how a person perceives their own racial ethnic group. It is a pivotal construct for a significant source of self-esteem. Scholars find protective and promotive associations between ethnic identity and well-being as ethnic identity buffers against other adverse life experiences for ethnic minority youth. And last, we focus on activism. Scholars note that increased exposure to discrimination leads to increased involvement in intergroup activism. Moreover, studies find that con confronting discrimination raises awareness of structural inequities, cultivates a collective pan-Asian identity, and promote activist efforts. Two theoretical frameworks scaffold our study. First, we employ Asian crit, which is situated in critical race theory. Building upon the foundations of CRT, Asian crit forefronts the racialized history of Asian immigrants and its backlash on Asian American citizenship. 
Asian Crit highlights Asian American experience shaped by historical and political context in order to examine the oppressive forces that work to deny citizenships and immigration rights, as well as outsider racialization, such as model minority stereotypes that persist in ma marginalizing Asian Americans. A second informing framework is intersectionality. We employ lenses of intersectionality to account for white supremacy and other forms of injustice that simultaneously impact the development of Asian Americans, their racial identities, and everyday experiences. Thus, we address the following questions. First, what are Asian college students' experiences with or views of anti-Asian discrimination due to COVID-19? Has the rise in anti-Asian discrimination during COVID-19 impacted ethnic identity among Asian college students? And last, how has involvement in intergroup activism changed during the COVID-19 pandemic among Asian college students? We aim to recruit current undergraduate and graduate students at U of A who have at least one parent of East Asian or, or and Southeast Asian heritage. Flyers were shared with major departments, student groups, and international student programs. We believe that we have not reached saturation and themes. We also think there will be different narratives as the pandemic has gone under control, as well as increased anti-Asian hate crimes have simultaneously increased. So we are planning to recruit more participants, especially international students. Focus groups were conducted separately between international and domestic students over Zoom using a semi-structured interview guide. We use thematic an analysis approach, a method for identifying, organizing, describing, and reporting themes within data. In this study, we identify as interdisciplinary research team of Asian doctoral students at the U of A. Three students are domestic and two students are international students, which positions us to have objective and subjective perspectives in the study. And here is the demographic information of our participants. Thank you, Say, for an introducing background of our study. And my name is Jen, and I will uh, take over from here and present our preliminary results. Um, for the first research question, what are Asian college students' experience with and views of uh, anti-Asian discrimination due to COVID-19? We were able to identify three major themes, vicarious discrimination, over discrimination and ambiguous discrimination. Vicarious or indirect forms of racial discrimination includes hearing about or seeing another person's of, um, experience of racism. It also explains close family members experiencing discrimination that may or may not be witnessed by participants. Participants reported hearing about anti-Asian discrimination experiences of others via social media and uh, direct reports from uh, family and friends. So all domestic and international students experience vicarious discrimination via media. For example, one participant explained that um, in videos or social media, for example, Asian people are attacked by you know, people in here in the States. They are Asian, and scared or they said um, bad things to them or something like that. I saw those things. So for me, I became to be more careful when I'm doing outside. There were also reports from families and um, friends. One of the domestic participants shared that, I have a friend who worked at the cafe and she also had a similar experience where a customer came up to her and asked her if she was from China. And my friend said, yes. And he started saying, you know, um, go back to China and things like that. Basically blaming her for the pandemic. The second type of discrimination is the overt discrimination, which are more direct experiences where participants themselves are the victims. So there are three uh, sub themes that we pulled were the verbal uh, harassment, physical aversion and uh, physical assault. One of the participants shared their experience of verbal harassment explaining, they use some profanity and they are like, all Chinese are here to kill us. Another student shared a story of physical aversion. I, so I'm a freshman right now, but last year I was in like in high school, I lived in Chandler, but I worked at the fast food chain and um, 
in the drive-thru. I had a customer not want to be served by me, so they want to be served by someone else when they came to the window. So I let my manager know and she took care of it. She kind of told them that, you know, we can't serve them anymore. Last, we found physical assault, where as a participant said, I had a couple of experience when I'm going to the lab or something from home, I have to take the bus or public, uh, public transportation. And when I go past along the bus stops, some guy, I did not look at him. He said, scum bucket, China boy, here to take our checks and then spat on me. And I'm like, okay, I'm just kept walking. The last thing in the discrimination is the ambiguous discrimination, where participant does not readily identify an experience as dis uh, direct discrimination or is unsure. An example of that is the, I think I was asked, asked uh, where are you from more often than before and during the, during the pandemic. Like when I went to fix my car in the, in the car service shop, but I feel a little bit uh, a little uncomfortable because it seems they, the person asked me vaguely if you brought the virus from China. Next, from the second research question, has the rise in anti-Asian discrimination during COVID-19 impacted ethnic identity among Asian college students? You were able to identify two major themes. First, we were able to identify heightened negative societal views of Asians. When asked about participants' perceptions of whether societal views of Asian changed during the pandemic, there were participants, um, both international and domestic consensus around American society's increased negative views of Asian due to COVID-19. So one participant said, oh yeah, definitely. I would say definitely and not in a good way, to be honest. There were also um, positive personal views of, uh, about ethnic, ethnicity and culture found in the focus group interviews. So for example, one participant described that um, I've just grown to appreciate more and my ethnicity and it's become more positive, honestly, since then. Um, Relevant to our last research question, has involvement in the intergroup activism changed during the COVID-19 among Asian college students? We found two broad themes. One, education as activism is, and um, barriers to activism. So most of participants did not identify themselves as activists, but they are willing to educate others about Asian racism. Um, so one of our um, domestic participants shared that, um, and then she was driving and then they were crossing street and then she almost hit them. And she was like breaking Wuhan's, that's all she said. And then I think she said something else, but the fact, she, the fact that she said breaking Wuhan's and I'm like, bro, you don't even know if they are Chinese, if they are Korean, something else. Um, that's when we had the conversation. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she's like, um, they're in the freaking way. And I was like, no, why did you call them freaking Wuhan's? You don't know if they are from China. And she's like, oh, it was just a joke. And I was like, nah, dude, I'm Chinese. You realize that, right? And she's like, oh, <clears throat> it was just a joke. And I was like, oh. Sorry. Sorry about that. You can be walking around saying stuff like that. And then she understood like around me, like that's not okay. The last theme we found was barriers to activism both domestic and international groups and willingness to educate others, but there were differences in this. We assume the difference um, 
originate from the ability and eligibility to take action or due to the paper status. Sorry about that. <clears throat> One of the domestic participants described their fear of COVID-19. Since the pandemic, I haven't done anything. In the sense of like speaking out against violence, I'm going to sit back rather than jumping out in the middle of the pandemic and getting sick. I had a lot of families members, family members getting uh, get sick and some passed away. One international participant shared his story um, about uh, his legal status. Like you don't uh, want to act outside of law basically. Yeah. So that's why I try not to engage as much physically such as visa status as well. And if I plan to stay for a job, I'm not sure if that's going to have an impact on how I look. And when people are interviewing me, you know, they probably see a criminal record, even though I'm not really criminal there, um, but because I got involved. So I guess that's one of the main reasons I, why I don't want to engage in political protest. Thank you, Jin. In sum, through the study, we found how COVID-19 pandemic was racialized in American society. Regardless of direct experiences, hate crimes exist and have always existed. We learned that Asian and Asian American students are aware of a hostile and discriminatory social context that have been cautious in their own individual level. This brings awareness to higher education professionals to better intervene and prevent anti-Asian bias on campus. We find important implications in the differences in understanding and responding to social justice between domestic and international students, which sheds light on the need for community-based approach to culturally relevant interventions, incorporating anti-racism in pandemic response and education. Given that our study took place in Arizona, Phoenix, and Tucson, we highlight the need for research on Asian and Asian Americans in rural areas in these, th in these times that is, we found the relevance of community support in Arizona and its impact on how Asian Americans deal with dire societal and political conditions. We also acknowledge the importance of sharing stories and narratives to be heard, to remember the past, which has easily been forgotten, see the present and work towards the future, where these stories provide foundations to emulate power, resilience, insight, and agency for Asian American youth and families in our times our team also believes that this power, resilience, and agency not only strengthens domestic students, but will also provide boots of support and advocacy for international Asian, Asian students. Thank you. Thank you to you both. Any questions? So I see some comments. Yes. So yes, sincere thank you. Thank yous from several people for the, the work that you're doing. This presentation. Any questions before we move on? Okay. So we thank you very much for that for that presentation and I hope we can come back to discuss some of those themes at the end of the session. Um, but I would like to move on now to our next presenter. Amanda Shokan is the co-program director in the College of Public Health Phoenix programs and assistant professor in the Department of Public Health Practice and Translational Science in the Mel and Edith Zuckerman College of Public Health at the University of Arizona. She is also a research assistant professor in geriatrics in the College of Medicine, Phoenix. She holds a PhD in gerontology and master's in healthcare administration from the University of Kentucky and a law degree from the University of Buckingham, England. Her professional experience includes faculty positions and administrative appointments in both gerontology and health administration, program evaluation, consultancy work on aging issues, personnel management and development and workplace culture. Her interests straddle the nexus of gerontology and healthcare. They include applied gerontology, elder rights and justice, elder abuse and mistreatment, cultural competence, LGBTQ plus aging, long-term care, aging and healthcare navigation, health promotion and well-being, 
provider relationships, and workforce planning development. That is quite an impressive uh, resume and set of interests. And we're so pleased to have you here today to talk about your most recent work focused on the impact of the pandemic on older adults. So thank you. Thank you very much. That just says that I'm a jack of so many different trades uh, as well. Um, I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Okay. All right. So I'm so excited to be here, and uh, uh, it's really it's it's really humbling to follow the uh, preceding um, um, presentation. That was really really heartfelt, and it's it, it shows again just uh, the many different ways in which COVID has affected us. So our study was um, about older adults and the impact of COVID-19. Uh, my colleague and I, Dr. Tracy Davies, who's at Rutgers, wanted to sort of figure out uh, what the impact might be for older adults. And so we uh, looked at older adults in two states. Uh, Tracy is at Rutgers, so she looked at, the, um, so she conducted the study in um, New Jersey, and I conducted the study here uh, in Kentucky. So here's our study, just very um, uh, briefly. So our purpose was to highlight the COVID-19 related experiences of older adults. Uh, and we were particularly interested to see if there were any psychosocial um, um, impacts on them, behavioral responses, and in particular, how it impacted the older adults' self-perception of well-being. So we had a diverse sample of older adults uh, beginning from age 55, so our uh, we had older adults age 55 to 97, that's the age of our oldest pa uh, participant. Uh, they covered all different types of races um, and ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status. And of course we had um, rural and suburban areas in New Jersey and, and Kentucky. Uh, so here's how it pans out. We ended up with 113 participants in New Jersey and 82 in Kentucky. And the average age was 74.5, 74 and a half years old and 64% female, which should not be any surprise to anyone who knows uh, about gerontology because uh, there are so many more females in later life than there are men. Um, recruitment, this was a real challenge. We hadn't expected it to be quite as challenging. Uh, when we started out, we were going to um, have the survey go out to uh, older adults, regardless of where they were, uh, but particularly those who lived in long-term care facilities and places like that. And we had an unimaginable amount of pushback, which makes perfect sense if you consider that we were trying to do this between June and December last year. Uh, most institutions, uh, most cities were in the uh, grip of COVID. Most people were really um, concerned about having other people come in and having people in the facilities, et cetera. And we did not propose to go into facilities, but we still couldn't find uh, facility managers and people like that to help us um, disseminate the survey. Um, our methods, we used the cross-sectional design. Our data collection, we created a survey, both hard copy and Qualtrics. So there was a digital copy as well. So we could email, we were trying to be mindful of the COVID restrictions so we could email those and they could be shared that way. And we analyzed our data using the IBM uh, SPSS. So here's what was in the survey. So we, because I'm thinking what sort of questions um, did we ask, you might be interested. So we had demographic, um, the usual demographic questions. Um, we asked about the household, who's living in the house, how many people, size of house. We also asked about COVID information, you know, sort of like, have you been exposed? Uh, have you tested positive? That sort of thing. Uh, for part two, we used the, the COVID-19 household environmental scale. Um, and we measured family functioning by looking at household conflict and household cohesion. Um, the third part, uh, we used selected items from the COVID-19 impact study, and this included um, a series of open-ended questions that uh, turned out to be interesting and informative. For part four, uh, we used the generalized anxiety disorder as, um, assessment, GAT7, and we used that to measure anxiety levels, um, three levels, mild, medium, or severe, five, mild, 10, medium, and 15, severe. And finally, we use the UCLA loneliness scale, and we use that to measure subjective feelings of loneliness and feelings of social isolation. 
So here's what we learned. Uh, in terms of the impact on lives, uh, the majority of our, our participants had not experienced any COVID-19 symptoms. Um, interestingly enough, many of them, a, a, a really good number, were actually complying with CDC guidelines. And we asked them if they were currently complying with the guidelines and if they had been complying with the guidelines for over two months. 78% um, of them were practicing social distancing, 50% hand washing and ma mask wearing, 72%. We asked them, and this is one of those open-ended questions, why they were doing uh, these things and why they were complying with CDC guidelines. And most of them said it was to stay safe and healthy and because it was the right thing to do. There were also other people who were concerned because they already had pre-existing conditions like COPD and cancer and feared for their health because they recognized that they were at high risk uh, for COVID. In terms of where older adults got the information about COVID-19, uh, we gave them a long list of, of different options um, and television was the top on the list, followed closely by family and friends and then the doctor, which really creates all kinds of um, interesting um, um, considerations uh, because most, depending on what television station you were watching, then you could have gotten different types of information about COVID because we rec we remember uh, that it was highly politicized. Um, um, that the communications about COVID were highly politicized. We also asked participants um, if their lives were disrupted um, by virtue of COVID. And over 75% said that it was at least moderately, um, um, moderately disrupted. We talked about social distancing and restrictions and how that impacted them. Um, and we found that for a lot of our respondents, um, it created all kinds of complications in terms of obtaining their medications and food and necessities. Some of them reported avoiding seeking medical care because they didn't want to go out. Uh, they want to go to hospitals because they were afraid of contracting the virus. And then the issue came up of the marginalization that was occurring, right? And so you might have, you might all have remembered the um, boomer remover meme that was going, going around and uh, conversations by people like Dan Patrick of Texas who said that older adults uh, should be willing to die for their children. So in terms of like disruption, 43.5% um, said their lives had been moderately disrupted and uh, just slightly over 30% said that their lives had been significantly di um, disrupted. Some of the other things that we learned was that a significant number of our older adults uh, were afraid and their fears related to the behaviors of others who were not uh, complying with the CDC guidelines. Uh, a lot of them reported missing family and friends. Um, for those who lived with family, there was less family cohesion, uh, some degree of loneliness, not as much as, as we thought we'd find, but the um, older the participants were, the more likely, uh, the higher the levels of loneliness that they reported. And then we found low levels of um, general anxiety um, disorder. So I thought that I'd share some of the, um, uh, the responses, the written and responses that we got so that you get a sense of where our participants were. Um, someone reported, uh, wrote this in uh, when we asked the question, what, what, what has been the biggest impact on you of COVID-19? Not being able to see and hug my family and not having my senior companion. So this was another adult who who lived um, alone and had a senior companion who would come in every so often to visit. Somebody else said um, not, have, uh, not having to give up. Um, oh, this was in response to the question, what would have made the situation better? And this person said not having to give up my time with children and the grandkids would have made the situation better. Uh, somebody else said um, what they would have, uh, what would have helped them would be somebody to talk to and somebody to go out to eat dinner with, and they're looking forward to being able to do this after the pandemic is over, if it ever ends. And we had, um, yeah, and then we had someone else talk about um, the biggest fear, right, during the time of. Uh, during during the pandemic is fear of contracting the virus. They were also really afraid of civil unrest and all the political intensity that was surrounding uh, the COVID um, pandemic and approaching the elections. Uh, 
And finally, um, again, just to, to buttress this fear of other people's behaviors, um, uh, one of our participants said that they were very concerned about going out because of the clerks and people in stores who do not, who do not wear masks. So going forward, um, what could we learn from uh, what could we learn from, from uh, the study? Uh, the, the most important thing really was the unintended impact of the social restrictions um, and how it limited human interactions. This is particularly important when we consider that before COVID, we were already speaking about the silent pandemic um, of um, loneliness and isolation amongst older adults, especially those who, who live alone. Um, and the social, you know, uh, social distancing uh, created so many are that made that particularly worse. So now the issue is not whether we should not social distance, but going forward, the issue is how do we recognizing the peril, right, that older adults already um, uh, uh, have and the disadvantages and the uh, increased likelihood of social isolation and loneliness, how bearing in mind these things, can we come up with strategies that protect and ensure safety, yet recognize these unique needs of older adults and mitigate negative consequences for mental and emotional health. Uh, the importance of communication channels is, is, is critical. Talked about the fact that most of them got all their information from television. Um, I'm not sure how uh, accurate a source of, of uh, public health information that is. So it becomes important for us to, to um, note that this is where that information is coming from and how do we work towards ensuring that messaging and content is and, and content of the, of the um, information that they get is, is correct. Uh, the importance of the behavior of others. Um, we live in the community and uh, uh, at some level, the issue might be uh, we have a brother and a sister's keeper and what do we owe ourselves and especially what do we owe older people, which takes me very nicely to the issue of marginalization in a lot of ways. Um, the older adults felt that their needs had not been considered um, and somehow that they were in the way. Uh, there was also the issue of ageism and just how um, how the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has shed bright new light on this issue within our society. And so going forward, some of the things that we probably need, what we should be looking at is how do we raise sensitivity and awareness about ageism and about the need to create a society where older adults are just uh, about as well integrated and valued as every other age. And what sort of responses do we need uh, in order to address those things. And finally, um, just, uh, uh, just, just, uh, just, uh, just a warning, I guess, or a heads up, uh, COVID-19 took us by surprise. Um, it's probably not going to be the last time that a pandemic or something of this um, type comes across, but we shouldn't, we will no longer have the uh, defense that we were taken um, unaware. So we should be preparing for this and we should be thinking long-term. If a pandemic comes again and we have older adults who are at risk, how do we position ourselves so that we can provide for their safety, we can mitigate risk without exacerbating the conditions and the issues that already concern them? Thank you. I'll take any questions. Thank you very much for that um, very interesting talk. We do have a couple of questions um, that people have, have submitted. So we have one question, what recommend, recommendations do you have for communications to older adults? Let me just stop sharing so that I can see. Oh, great, <laughs> this is so much better. I was just looking at my screen. So what recommendations do we have for communications with older adults? Um, so the, this is this is uh, this one was, was difficult for us to work with because um, given the pandemic, for instance, right, um, the usual places where older adults go where they could have gotten useful information were sort of closed out to them. They weren't going to see their doctors, right? They weren't seeing members of their family, so that's an issue. The second issue was because, in particular, with COVID, because of the way that it was politicized. And because different media stations shared different types of news, then even if your family talked to you about it, you probably just got the version that your family got, 
right? So uh, we really need to start thinking about, you know, a public health messaging. And this actually really, uh, I, I think what it highlights is um, the role of government, whether it's local, state or federal in addressing these issues and the importance of getting a unified single message. Uh, something that I didn't share that came up in, in, um, in, in the survey, we asked participants, you know, when we asked them what would have helped, quite a few people said um, just the, the, the messaging, just the unified, clear message coming from every sector. And we also asked them to rate um, um, how well they thought that you know government was doing with the message, and no one, well maybe a couple of people said that uh, the the message from the federal government was great, but most people thought that the message from the states were great. And so remember, this is Kentucky and 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 um, and New Jersey. So we're going to have to figure out some way to get the politics out. Um, so that the science leads and that's the message that everybody gets. It's a work in progress, what can I say? I can't hear you. Yes, sorry, we have a couple of other questions here. Okay. Um, one is, can you confirm when the study started and ended? Yes, so um, June 2020 to December. So we started in June and we, we ended in December. That's when we collected the data. Thank you. And then two um, other questions. One, um, any age difference in terms of the impact of COVID? I'm thinking about whether the youngest old group experienced fewer restraints than, or constraints than the oldest old group. Yes, that is exactly right. So um, I, I don't know if you remember the slide when I talked about the fact that we did, you know, the lonely, we didn't see as much, you know, the complaint about uh, the anxiety and loneliness as we have thought. But the older the participants were, the more likely they were to complain about being lonely and being, and being isolated, right? So we didn't see that um, amongst the young people. Then there was also um, something else that is probably just an artifact of our sample. Um, not a lot of people lived with families. So a, a, a significant number of them lived by themselves, right? And so when you asked about family cohesion and family conflict, it really wasn't an issue, right? Because they live by themselves. Um, but again, on the, other on the other side of that, no family conflict, no, uh, none of those issues, but still that loneliness and that isolation. And yes, there's a, a difference between the young old and the you know, middle old and the older old. The older you were, the more likely you were to have the negative impacts. Thank a you. stronger negative impacts as it were. Thank you. I'd actually at this point like to invite um, questions for any of the panelists and, and the rest of the panelists, feel free to, to join us here. Um, and if you'd like to, you can put your, um, continue to put your question in the, the Q&A um, or you can raise your hand. We're also happy to, to allow you to talk and ask your question out loud as well. And again, we're across any of the talks here if you have specific questions or general comments or observations. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I just saw a question here that I thought was interesting. Uh, somebody asked, uh, does tech literacy matter for those in better of situations who have access to the internet and also smartphones, whether the situation is better? That's a great question. Unfortunately, that's not one that we addressed, you know, but, but, that, is, but that is a great question. I do know from, um, I do know from other um, studies that I'm involved in, not this particular one, um, that the ability, especially when you think in terms of Zoom, FaceTime and that sort of thing, the ability to engage technology that way has made a really big impact for people who could not see their family members in person, right? But were able to communicate this way. And, and it, in, in a lot of ways, the term social, uh, you know, the term social distancing is kind of unfortunate. I think maybe we should have said you know, physical distancing or something would have been better, right? But, the, you know, uh, I guess we were just responding to things. So um, one good thing, though, if I may say so, that has come out of COVID and the reliance on technology is that now 
people were forced to find new ways of communicating with their older adult friends and relatives, right? And technology allowed us to do that. And so before people would wait to be able to see people in person. And so if you were an older adult who lived in Kentucky and your family lived in California, you can imagine how hard that's going to be. But now we have a lot of anecdotal stories about family members who are part of their other families interactions. Like they have dinner maybe once a week, um, they're telling stories, they're reading bedtime stories to their grandchildren because we were forced to do that. And my hope is post COVID, you know, that we continue to recognize how technology can help us bridge that gap. Um, it's, not, it's not as good as being there and putting your hands on your old person and giving them a hug, but at least it helps. It's better than nothing. Right, like that positive potential outcome. Yes. There. We do have a question that cuts across the, the panelists here. Um, the president and the provost are pressuring staff and faculty to come back to campus. Could the panelists um, comment on if there are any concerns or are we prepared to open based on your research? A large policy question. Any of you feel comfortable tackling even just a piece of that or maybe what may what considerations based on your research may need to be taken um, in, in planning to reopen? I can jump in at the start um, with what what is, I think, evident at face value to everyone, which is you can't have people back on campus until schools and child care facilities are running at full force again. So I know there is a a flurry of activity now because of Ducey's order this week that everybody starts back March 15th um, in terms of public schools, but that still leaves space for schools to be going hybrid as their model. It doesn't say that you need to be offering full day care or aftercare programs or these pre-pandemic hours <laughs> that many families relied on to not only educate their children, but also provide a safe place for their children to be while they were on campus or wherever they were doing their work from. Um, so, I mean, really it, it can't be a unilateral U of A decision until the rest of these social systems are back in play. And on the childcare side, um, there's also been a ton written about how economically stressful the pandemic has been for childcare providers. It's a business model that works on super small margins anyway. It is not a lucrative business. And so when you are doing these additional cleaning protocols and have far fewer children that can be in a classroom, um, the chance that they can open at capacity to offer children slots that were there before or the hours. Um, we've seen places shutter permanently because of the pandemic and the financial hit that they've taken. One of the major midtown preschools that's been here for 65 years is, is going offline at the end of the year. Um, so so it, it can't be done easily yet. So if, if I take the older people's perspective. And I actually have a slight advantage, if you can call it that here, because I'm part of another study. It's the Saguaro story, study. It's a University of Arizona study, which is actually looking at the concerns of older U, uh, U Arizona employees as we come back to campus, right? So, but, but just to extrapolate from the study that I am actually speaking about here, um, if you recall one of the things that I talked about that older adults found most concerning was the behavior of other people, right? So I may do everything that I'm supposed to do. You could see that we had high numbers of people wearing their masks, washing their hands and socially distancing. But if other people around me don't do what they're supposed to do, then, you know, I'm still, you know, plumb out of luck. So in, in Going forward, right, um, I think our recognition that we are a community and that we are dependent on each other, right, and that, you know, we're only as good as the healthiest person, right? So if we share that care model, right, where we protect ourselves and we're mindful of the fact that we should prote protect other people, then that might be a good thing, to um, a good way to start. The other thing that comes out of that study is the fact that, um, there were so many different levels of perception of risk based on people's realities, right? So if you had uh, a pre-existing condition, COPD or cancer or something, right, then you had a different level of worry compared to maybe somebody else who, who didn't. And so just us understanding and creating um, an environment where maybe older adults who feel like they have reason to be more 
careful or safe or have a higher risk be accommodated in terms of how they return to work and how they, they do work. Uh, I just want to share my own concern regarding Asian population in the in the campus. So um, a common another common topic that brought brought up in our focus group is that uh, most Asian students they um, they followed the shelter in place act for a long time, almost a year. So that kind of protected them from like um, experiencing some. Um, discriminations or um, racism because they just stay at home and they did not go out or um, like social interaction was minimal during this time. But um, when we go back to the campus, in, uh, like go back to in-person classes, um, what 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 happens then like for to these Asian students or Asian faculty or Asian um, staff on the campus? So that that um, that's my concern, like whether campus have a like um, policy or protection for this uh, population, and um, yeah, I guess that's my concern. Important. Other questions or comments. I will say I was struck across these talks about really the importance of communication. Um, and so you, you specifically address this in terms of how to communicate with older adults, but thinking about, um, I guess from, from thinking about discrimination um, among Asian students, thinking about two things, one vicarious discrimination and really thinking about how that can be tied to, to sort of communication, but then also the relative, um, how that kind of discrimination has been relatively hidden um, so really the, the work that you're doing is so important in communicating that that's happening to a wider audience. And then to Madeline's findings about a lot of the um, you know, faculty on staff on campus didn't know what to ask for. So this kind of idea of community, like I need help, but I don't even know what that would look like. And so really thinking, I, I think that overall the pandemic has highlighted a number of areas um, where we need to do better um, about talking about challenges and then reaching sorts of sort of collective solutions for those. Any other, we're almost out of time. I, I think one of the things that struck me with all of our different topics is just how important it is um, that we create a society that takes care of everybody, right? So um, the caregivers of people with children, caregivers of older people, older people, people of Asian descent, you know, if, if, if we f figure out and prioritize just taking care of each other, right, then we might do a whole lot better in terms of what we, uh, in terms of how we address each other and how we cope with uh, situations like this. Yes. That's a good point. I have shared um, contact information for the speakers in case you'd like to continue those conversations. Um, they would be happy. And I, I do also want to um, invite, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much for the presenters. Thank you all for coming today. Um, and I hope you come back in two weeks when we have same time, same place, when we have three talks on, again, three different populations that uh, may been, have been particularly vulnerable and continue to be particularly vulnerable during the pandemic. And so we'll be following the same format. Um, we really hope you can join us for those talks as well. And as always, the sort of whoops, final plug here, my mouse seems to not be cooperating. Um, we do hope that you can follow us, go to our, our website, um, follow our updates on Facebook. And again, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much to our panelists. This has been um, really interesting and you're all doing very important work. And I'm, I'm so glad that we could invite you here to share it today. So thank you all. Take care. <laughs>